We ask that your Holy Spirit, O oh God, would sustain us and that you will continue to count us among the blessed. Now I pray, O oh God, that the words that are spoken and shared this morning be words that will transform our lives as we continue to seek after you. All this we ask and pray in the name of the one who gave his life and gave the great abundance, Jesus Christ, our blessed Lord and our Savior. Amen. Church, if you would turn to your neighbor and tell them God loves you and so do I. God loves you. They're asleep because they have no idea of the, of the pressure 
missing. So even Jesus now, unable to count on his friends, he has no family with him at this hour, and his friends have fallen asleep. And Jesus knows that in a short period of time they're going to arrest him. And so you can imagine what's going on in Jesus, the human being, the human side of Jesus, the one that you and I can identify with. We know what it's like to be Jesus in holy being. We may not know what it's like to be Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. We may not know what it's like to be Jesus when he's calling Lazarus, Lazarus forth out of the tomb, but we do know what it's like uh, to be Jesus when there is something going on so deeply and profoundly painful in your life. And there seems to not be an exit. We know what it's like to be under that level of stress. And so this is the time when we can say to Jesus, perhaps we are closer than we realize. Perhaps we really do understand what Jesus is going through. reason we don't want to identify with the human side of Jesus is because we need to know that we have a Savior who is above all of that. We don't want a Savior who suffers. We don't want a Savior who's in shame. But the reason why we love Jesus so much is because Jesus knows what it's like to suffer. Jesus knows what it's like to experience shame. We do need to have a God who is sympathetic to our own plight. And so Holy Week for us, as much as perhaps we would like for it to be a nice, clean week, a week where we feel as if we're in charge or we're controlling and manipulating events, the truth of the matter is Holy Week for Jesus was anything but tidy. It was messy. It was, it was messy. It was a, 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 a filled with pain, filled with confusion. You can only imagine the whirlwind of emotion going on in Jesus' mind. Jesus knew that in the end, that they would crucify him, that his closest friends would abandon him, the one who he trusted the most, Peter, would deny them three times before the top broke once. Wow, what friends? Who needs friends like that in difficult times like this? But Jesus takes them along with them anyway. Jesus is gone, taken up before the authorities. And they ask Jesus, Pilate says to Jesus, Are you the Son of God, the King of the Jews? Notice what Jesus says. Jesus says, You have said so. Now, many of us would perhaps have thought, would have appreciated a much more direct answer. Are you the Pilate's question to Jesus is very direct. Are you the king of the Jews? The son of the Messiah, the Son of God. I, the, the, the human side of me wanted Jesus to say, You better believe I am. Absolutely. Or in the words of OJ, 100 percent absolutely guilty. I am the Son of God. It would have been nice to have Jesus. Be a little bit more clear with Pilate. But Jesus says to Pilate, you have said so. And then when Jesus is before the Sanhedrin, they ask him the same question. Are you the Son of God? You have said so. Now in no way is this a denial on Jesus' part about his identity. But what it says is Jesus is wrestling as a human being with this unique calling from God. It is not an easy call. It is a call that is filled with fear. It is a call that is filled with uncertainty. I suspect that the human side of Jesus says, Lord, I want to go through this, but I want to make sure that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing for you and not for me. Because if I'm doing it for me, I know that this is the end of my life. There's a part of Jesus that says, Lord, remind me that this is about you. Let this stuff pass for me if it's about me. Please, Lord, give me the wisdom and the insight to say, hey, stop before you get to a place where you cannot turn around. If it's about me, Lord, I think this is what Jesus was saying in the Garden of Gethsemane as he was praying and he was conflicted. Lord, please, if this is about me and only me, stop me. Let this cup pass from me. I get it. But then Jesus says, but if it's about you, God, then don't stop me. If it's according to your will. You can only imagine the stress that Jesus is under going into Holy Week. And the people who are questioning him, wanting to know if he's the Messiah. And Jesus is wrestling when he says, You said so, you have said so. It is Jesus' way of saying to the authorities, asking them questions, You have said so. You are right. In some ways, Jesus turns the table on the person asking the question. But it would have been nice for Jesus to just get a little bit more concrete. And the text goes on to say that when the chief priest and the elders question him, he's silent. Why? Because Jesus, the human side of Jesus, said, I'm not 
Because we really don't get it. But it is Jesus who, despite the fact that his apostles flee, never once condemns them for their lack of faith. Knowing what he has to go through and what he's facing. This messy period in his life, this has to be the messiest period in Jesus' life. This, this is ugly. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't look right. They're everything about holy me. And what Jesus has to go through is very unsettling. And Jesus knows it. And you and I know it. Because we know what it's like to suffer. We know what it's like to be marginalized. We know what it's like to have our friends abandon us when things get hot. We have family members that who say, I want to be with you through thick and thin, and as soon as the thing shows up, they're gone. We know, we can identify what's right about holy because this looks too much like our own story. It may not take on necessarily the characteristics found in Scripture, but everything that Jesus is going through, we can identify with. And so perhaps the lesson for us going into Holy Week is perhaps we shouldn't try so hard to have our life all together and to have it on point. But it's okay to enter into Holy Week with a little bit of mess. It's okay if you haven't gotten everything just right the way you want to have it. Maybe that's exactly what God is saying. You're trying too hard to make something work, but you can't make it work until you're ready to take the journey. Maybe you've got to go through a little bit of suffering in order to celebrate the joy. And so I think Jesus is inviting us to walk with him in this messy moment in his life. It is so messy for Jesus that even on the cross, Jesus said, my God, my God, you too? Why have you forsaken me? I mean, after everybody, God, have left me, I'm here alone. I think Jesus says, you, and you? One scholar puts it, bluntly it says, it, it's almost as if after Jesus has lost all of his friends, and the only uh, being that he can count on is God, and it is as if God has said, okay, now it's time to turn off the lights. It's over. I mean, that's how Jesus felt. As if somebody had turned the lights out on him. But from on high. And what happens when Jesus, even Jesus, feels as if God has forsaken him? Oh, this is this is messy. The people are taunting him and calling him all sorts of names and saying, don't get him off the cross. If he's truly who he says he is, he'll get off, or God will get him off. But don't you do a thing to help him. Doesn't that sound familiar? That's human nature. There's a folk who say, don't you lift a finger to help her. She got herself into this mess. She trusted in God. Let's see if God will get her out. Oh, everything about this text reminds us of just what it means to be human and have friends who uh, at certain moments and periods in life, while they may mean well, they can't endure the level of stress that you endure, nor can they endure the level of compassion that you need them to have in your darkest hour. Jesus no so we can see, as I prepare to take my seat, we can see just how messy Holy Week is. It starts out messy. The fact that Jesus enters Jerusalem on a donkey signals trouble. You remember when you released listening to the gospel of Father Church and read it? The gospel said that as soon as Jesus entered into Jerusalem, the whole city was in a, in a term, in turmoil. They were in turmoil over Jesus. As soon as he got there, trouble began. Now I'd like to somehow put Jesus in a, a different category as opposed to some kids and relatives that show up and you know that as soon as they come through the front door, all uh, is about to break loose. I don't want to put Jesus in that category, but as soon as he walks into Jerusalem, as soon as he rides into Jerusalem, the whole of Jerusalem is a large thing, it's a large city. It takes three days to walk from end to end. The text tells us as soon as he came in, Jesus drew attention to himself. And you know that the moment you draw attention to yourself, you're beginning to ask for trouble. People say, who is he? Who is that? And nobody else is on a donkey. And of course, riding a donkey, going on in the Passover into Jerusalem, signifies royalty. What Jesus is doing when he rides a donkey is not as innocent as you may think it is. What he's saying is, I am the new king. So during Passover, what happens? Jesus rides through the West Gate, the Damascus Gate, on a donkey, while Pontius Pilate and Caesar come through another gate. So at the same time, these two forces, these two powers, are coming to 
It's not as if he said, I'm tired of walking. Ooh, give me a ride. He said, go get the donkey. I need to make a political statement that I am the Son of God. I am the true Son of God. Remember, Caesar is also declared Son of God. If you remember your history, the Caesars are divine. So how is it that on the holiest day, even in Jerusalem, in the life of the Jewish people, that you have Jesus, this poor, itinerant preacher, uh, uneducated by societal standards, born to a young mother out of wedlock, to a man who isn't really his father, proclaims himself a king against a dynasty, a folk who have always been acknowledged as divine. So Jesus entering into Jerusalem is bringing trouble and attention to himself. But when he turns up the heat, and when things get more complicated, then you begin to see who Jesus' real friends are. You begin to see just how far people were willing to go with Jesus. Even his friend Peter says, I, I can't take this. This is a bit too much. And the disciples, they disperse. Because as human beings, they did what we would do. Their lives are equally as messy as Jesus's. The irony of the story is that Pontius Pilate's wife, it's an interesting exchange, Pontius Pilate's wife says to him, the only time we ever hear anything from Pilate's wife have nothing to do with this man. She said, I have mad, I have nightmare about Jesus. I'm telling you, he's innocent, have nothing to do with him. And the gospel seems to imply that Pontius Pilate looked for a way to release Jesus. If you were listening to the gospel lesson, you sort of saw a softer side, and I put that in quote, a softer side of Jesus, of Pontius Pilate. Well, what? But who, for whom shall I release for you? Jesus Barabbas, who, by the way, was a notorious murderer and an insurrectionist. Or should I release for you Jesus, the one who's called the Messiah, who's been given sight to the blind, who's been feeding the poor, who's been encouraging the homeless, who's been giving spirit uh, to those who have been forgotten? Which one do you want me to release? And the reason that the people, the Gospels get it right, the reason that they cried Jesus the Rabbis is because they were envious and jealous of all that God was doing in Jesus. When you ask for a known murderer and insurrectionist to be put back out on the streets over someone who's done nothing but good, you can imagine the depth, not only the depth of, 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 of jealousy that they had for Jesus, but also the depth of confusion. You see, church, everybody in the story is confused. Everybody's mixed up. Everybody's mixed up. And that's what makes the Holy Movement a complicated people. That's why it's a messy movement. And so I want to encourage you, St. James, as you begin this journey, entering into Holy Week, you don't have to come with everything in your life nice, clean, and tidy. You don't have to have it all together. I think Jesus is saying, bring all of you to the altar. Bring all of your pain, all of your worries, the very things that put you under a deep amount of stress, bring it all. This is the week where you and I are to wrestle with God. It's okay to question God. I, I remember growing up, and many of you perhaps the same, where in Sunday school, a Sunday school teacher, if we raised ask a question as to why God did something, why God said something, I, I, we had an old school, uh, an old school, and by that I mean I'm talking about old school raised Sunday school teacher who would say, it is not our right to question God. God is, and God will do whatever God wants to do. I remember that line. But Jesus, even Jesus, wrestles and questions God. Are you sure I'm the one? John the Baptist, in his imprisonment, before his beheading, sends his disciples, go ask Jesus if he is the one or should we expect another. John is saying, before I give my life for something, I want to make sure it's the real deal. Go ask him if he's the one or am I supposed to look for somebody else? Everybody in Scripture is searching. And Holy Week is a time for us to search. It's okay if you don't have all the answers. You're not supposed to have all the answers. If you had, you wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be in this place asking God to give us answers. But I invite you, church, as you go through this.
this week to bring the shattered parts of your life to the altar. Trust me, you're not alone. You're not alone. All of us have shattered moments in our lives. Just bring it. And watch how God will transform your life from a point and a period of death into resurrection. That's the joy of bringing our broken selves, or as the Psalms said today in your hearing, broken vessels like broken pots. That's the reason we come to God, almost like a broken vessel. God, Jesus came to his heavenly Father as a broken vessel. I don't want to look at this. This frightens me. I don't want to hear the pain. But there was something about Jesus who, even on the cross, for some strange reason, his sorrow did not trump his joy. And I believe it's because Jesus knew that in the end, the will of God would prevail. You can bring your brokenness to God if you know and trust that in the end, the will of God for your life, which is always filled with joy, hope, love, mercy, compassion. If you know that God is going to resurrect your life, no matter what you are dealing with, you have the strength to come and bring it to the altar. Because you know, just like Jesus, you may be on the cross for a night, <coughs> but joy really does come in the morning. Amen.